All right, all right. Well, what's happening, everybody? Good morning, good morning. So glad that you are here. I want to invite you back to your seats as we prepare to dive in. So good to see each and every one of you. Uh, if I have not had a chance to meet you, uh, my name is Jack. I get to be one of the pastors here, and we're thrilled that you chose to spend time with us this weekend. We want you to make yourself uh, right at home as you connect with others, as you kind of get plugged in. If you're new, it's your first time. Uh, man, thank you so much for spending time with us. If you don't know anything about us, just know we're all about Jesus. In fact, our whole goal and mission is to help people discover and follow Jesus. And, um, and, and I know that we're kind of biased, but we think there's no better way to start your Sunday than right here at, at City Line Church. And so uh, we love it that you are, are with us today. Before I dive in, I just want to um, give a quick shout out uh, and just say thank you to each and every person uh, that served uh, so faithfully on Friday. Friday, we had our trunk or treats uh, with uh, Olive Crest and partnership, and so it was good stuff to uh, invite the community on campus. We had about, uh, I don't know, 20, 24 cars or trunks out there. We had tons of people showing up from the neighborhoods and surrounding areas, and it was just great to be able to greet them, walk alongside them, um, as we also participated as a church in serving them and also the families um, being engaged and involved. And then and then lastly, uh, you know, uh, 2-0, I, I hear, Dodgers uh, up in the World Series, um, <laughs> For those of you that have been faithfully praying for that, I just want you to say that that still works for other areas in your life too. Continue to, to pray faithfully and, uh, and, and see what God can do. All right, uh, we're gonna dive in and today we're gonna, uh, we're gonna finish, we're gonna bring to a close, we're, we're, we're finally there, uh, the last piece of one another, right? Which uh, one another, yeah, so, so there's like two people that are like, finally, we're not gonna talk about relationships anymore, you know, relationships out of control, you know, like, uh, but we said none of us are crushing it at relationships. Uh, none of us have the whole relational dynamic thing figured out. So we said we wanted to take fall and we just wanted to kind of focus an extended time talking about relationships, relational dynamics, this idea of one another, which is essentially God's heart for healthy and whole relationships. What, what does that actually look like in our lives? This idea of one another described throughout scripture is simply communicating the way that this community of Jesus followers was to live out the truth of Jesus in connection with each other. That we are called to a relationship with God, but not just a relationship with God, we're called to a relationship with one another as the family of God. And that should be important for us because you and I being designed for connection, we have to know that, that relationships are the primary context of our lives. Relationships are everywhere, whether with your family, your roommates, your job, coworkers, uh, people that you meet out in the community, no matter where you are, there is some type of relational dynamic that exists. And of all of the influences in our lives, relationships are among the most crucial. They have a deep lasting impact on our lives. And in a world that's becoming more and more lonely, more and more detached, more and more disconnected, in a world of unhealthy and broken relational patterns, we're inviting God to show us something different, to, to, to renew the way that we approach our relationships, to reframe our understanding of relationships, to teach us how to grow in healthy and God-honoring relationships, all the while continuing to grow in our own spiritual maturity. How do we continue to do that? How do we take next steps? We said, well, first of all, it starts with you. It's not about them. It's not about what they're doing. It's not about how they got things working out in their life. It, it starts with, with you. God, what do you want to show me? God, what do you want to do in me? God, what needs to change in me? That's important because we said that it's impossible for a follower of Jesus to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. That if we're going to be good at relationships, we have to understand God cares about the whole of our life, our spiritual life, our relational life, our emotional life, right? all of that, our physical life. God cares about the whole thing. You cannot d d d dissect, a, a disconnect. Those are, those are all inseparable pieces. So again, I encourage you, if you missed a week or two, I invite you back online. There, there's plenty of great information as we've established a solid foundation for learning to love more like Jesus. That's been the whole goal. How do we learn to love? more like Jesus, knowing that loving well is the defining characteristic of emotional and spiritual maturity. In other words, how am I growing spiritually? A mark of a maturing follower of Jesus is growing in our love for God as well as in our love for one another. That one another piece, though, is difficult. <laughs> Last week, you were reminded how difficult it is because sometimes, depending on how we approach relationships, we either go from an I-it standpoint where everybody serves me, everybody's a means to an end, everybody's a thing, whatever I can get out of you, or 
We can change our perspective with the help of Jesus and see everybody as an I, thou, created in the image of God, just like you've been created in the image of God. And in spite of our differences and our backgrounds and our uniquenesses, we can still learn to love one another in a God honoring a way. But let's just be real. There's nothing easy about relationships. Today ought to be a real fun one because everything that we've talked about up to this point actually comes crashing right here today on this final piece. Well, why, why is that? Because today, today I want to talk about conflict and disagreements. Aren't you glad you came to church, yeah. right? Because some of you got some conflict, right? You came with conflict. You had conflict on the car on the way to church, right? Trying to get out of the house on time, get there. I got to be there. I got my seat. I got to get there. I got to get my coffee. Uh, you know, I got to order. I got to get the order in. Whatever it is, there's, there's conflict on the way here. There's disagreements that we have in our life. But also there's this idea of what the scriptures talk about that God calls us to. It's called peacemaking. Yeah. Peacemaking. Peacemaking. Let's start today in Colossians chapter three. If you brought your Bibles to church today, hopefully you have them with you. If you do, you can open them up to Colossians chapter three. If you're new to the scriptures today, you're gonna go to the New Testament and you're gonna go all the way over to the right and you're gonna keep going, okay? You're gonna go past all the gospels. You're gonna go past some of the letters. You're gonna get to one of Paul's letters, which is Colossians. Colossians chapter three. We've studied Colossians a lot together as a church. Paul is writing to a multi-ethnic church in a place called Colossae. He reminds them of something important. In all of their unique differences, being a multi-ethnic church with everything that's going on, he says, I wanna remind you of your new identity in Jesus. I, I, wanna, I wanna make that the forefront. I want you to know and remember what that looks like because here's his charge to the church. I want you to live alive in Christ. I want you to live alive in Christ. And, and matter of fact, in spite of your differences, in spite of everything that could divide you, everything that could be divisive among you, everything that you can disagree upon. How many of you know we live in a culture of adamant disagreement? Right? We disagree about everything. Even as it relates down to hamburgers. Right? We want to disagree on who has the best hamburgers. Right? Is it like five guys or is it like in and out? Right? And, and you can start a war literally among a group of people depending on what that is. Right? Is it the Dodgers or is it the Angels? Is it the Chargers or is it the Rams? Right? Do you see where I'm going with that? Uh, you can pick any kind of thing, no matter how serious or how trivial to others, and we'll find a way to actively argue and disagree about it. So, so Paul says, in the midst of the reality of our human condition and knowing that's true about us, he says this to the church in Colossae in, in chapter 3, starting in verse 12. He says, I want you to live in your new identity, I want you to live as in Christ. So he says, therefore, therefore, as God's chosen people, that's your new identity. God chose you. You didn't choose God. God chose you. He saw you when you were afar, saw when you were deep in sin, and God chose to step in and do something for you. God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. God's made you new by a relationship with Jesus. Right? He's cleansed you from unrighteousness when you said yes to Jesus and for the forgiveness of your sins. You have to know that you are dearly loved, that God's love remains. It stays. It doesn't go away. Right? Your love, just like we sang today, it doesn't go anywhere. God's not going to walk out on you. God's not going to abandon you. God's not going to forfeit his love for you. God's going to continue to pursue you. You are dearly loved. And then he goes on and he says something fascinating. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. <laughs> now, just if you're not picking up what Paul's putting down, right? He's not talking about fashion. Right? You clothe yourselves. You know what I'm saying? Got a little bit of patience on today, right? Got a little bit of gentleness. You know what I'm saying? Suited and booted, ready to go. No, no, no. What he's talking about, he says, if you're going to live in, in, in Christ, right? If you're going to live with the power of the Holy Spirit in you, he says, I want you to live in such a way that what people see and experience when they are with you is the fruit of God's Spirit in you. Remember we said that the idea of the fruit of God's spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. So he says, if you have this new identity, don't just walk around with the knowledge of the new identity. Don't just walk around being able to communicate that you have this new identity, that God loves me, that God loves me, but then somehow that inhibits you from actually loving other people. He says, instead, because you are living in your new identity, he says, fully live that out and put on, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, 
patience. You can't do that on your own. That's with the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Verse 13, this is interesting. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. How, how many of you know you got some people in your life, you got to bear with them? Anybody? Okay, so we're not, I'm not the only one, okay? I'm preaching to myself today, by the way, okay? Uh, so I, I need you to track with me. Bear with one another, forgive one another, okay? Now, the idea of forgiveness, I just want you to get the idea of forgiveness in your mind. I want you to think about forgiveness. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. But Paul says, this is what you are called to as the new family of God. Forgiveness, forgive one another, bearing with one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, here it goes again, he's going right back to our key foundational value. He says, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, listen clearly to what Paul's saying. He's saying there's no shortage of stuff in your life and in your relationships that can cause dysfunction and can cause division and can cause disunity. There's no shortage of things that can happen in your family dynamic, in your friend group, in your workplace, right? Wherever you find yourself that can cause dysfunction and disunity and divisiveness to where we are going after each other. We are not bearing with each other. We refuse to forgive each other. And instead, we just come at each other. He says, whatever those grievances are, he says, we can respond differently as we choose. Listen, this is a choice over all these things. He says, put on love. Put on love. What what did we learn about love? That we are to love God, yes. Love our neighbors, yes. But didn't Jesus kind of give us clarity on what that love of neighbor looks like when he says, I want you to love as I have loved you. That's the kind of love I want you to put on. I don't want you to put on that fake love. I don't want you to put on that Instagram love. I don't want you to put on that swipe right or left or whatever you're doing, love, right? That's not the kind of love he's talking about, right? He's not talking about your romance novel love, right? He's not talking about your made-for-TV movie love, right? What he's talking about is the love that took the cross, the love that bled and died, the love that was willing to be placed in a, a, a deep, cold tomb and raised to new life so that you can be raised to life. He says, it's that kind of love. It's a love that's sacrificial. It's a love that gives, right? It's a love that, that, that chooses to, to lean in. And he says, it binds everything together and it holds the unity together. You see that? Unity together. Now, do you know that you can have unity and still have disagreement? I'm just checking, right? Making sure you're tracking with me. But, but let's just talk about this for a second. How are you with conflict today? How are you with conflict? When it comes to conflict, how are you with conflict? I want to suggest that one of the biggest killers of any healthy, thriving relationship is mismanaged tension that comes with conflict. It happens time and time again. If relationships are normal, though, here's what we also have to understand. Conflict is also inevitable. Why is conflict inevitable? Because people are complicated and messy. And because people are complicated and messy, you have to know conflict is inevitable. People will do messed up things. People will not always see eye to eye. This is true of of, of, of a husband and wife. This is true of parenting. It's true of kids and teens. It's true of adult kids with their parents. It's true of of roommates, coworkers, brothers, sisters. You name the relationship. Add in unmet expectations like we've talked about. Add in false assumptions, poor communication. Add in like everybody's different personalities and extended family role models that we've grown up with. Add in social dynamics that we're often swayed by more so than being swayed by scripture. And guess what happens? You got a lot of conflict and dysfunction. So here's what I wanna do just for a second because I think it's kinda, kinda fun. I, I, I want you to understand what is your role in, in the conflict, all right? I, I want you to understand, think about the last disagreement that you had, the last fight that you had with someone. Maybe, maybe it's just, it's fresh, right? Like I said, it was yesterday, it was this week, it was this morning on your way to church, you know, you were singing your worship music and then somebody cut you off on the way to church. And you, you thought you were praying for them, but that really wasn't praying coming out of your mouth, right? <laughs> so let's think about this. If you're taking notes, I want you to just draw a circle. Taking notes, just draw a circle. We'll put it up on the screen so you can see. Or listen, just draw a circle, okay? Uh, this is your piece of the pie, right? I want you to draw a circle, okay? Now, in this pie is 100% of the blame for what's going on. 
okay? You're thinking of the conflict. You're thinking of the disagreement. You're thinking of the argument. In this pie is 100% of all the blame. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to now draw a slice of pie that represents your responsibility for that conflict. Go ahead. Just represents your responsibility for that conflict. If it's me, mine would look a little bit like this. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else there? Right? The conflict exists, the problem, the issue's there. But if I was to kind of try to figure out for myself what's their part, what's my part, definitely my part looks a lot like that. You might be in the same boat. Here's what I want to do today over our next few moments together as we unpack this this real quick and hopefully try to help some people with the conflict in your life. I, I want you to just focus on that part. No matter how big it is, no matter how small it is, no matter, no, you know, it, it, maybe you got a bigger slice of the pie. I, I don't know what that looks like for you. Here's what I want you to do. Like we said, we're starting with us. We're starting with us. So I want, I want you just to kind of focus in on your piece of the pie. I know they've done stuff. I know they've said stuff. I know you're annoyed by them. I know, I know, I know, I know. You know. But let's start with your role. Let's start with your response. Let's start with what God is calling you to. The good news, I hope it's good news for you, is that scripture is not absent of conflict. The scriptures are not absent of conflict. They're not absent of family dysfunction. They're not absent of relational dysfunction, right? There's messy people that we read about all throughout scripture who are dealing with lots of relational dynamics just like you and I are. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, talks about it. He addresses it when he writes the letter, his letter to the church. If you are in Colossians, just go a little bit over to the right. Keep going and you'll find James. James chapter four. Hang out there, put your finger there because we're gonna talk about James quite a bit today because he has some really great things to say that helps us as it relates to conflict. In looking at your piece of the pie, understand this is what James writes in James four, starting in verse one, okay? Writing to the church, he's a leader in the church. These are first century followers of Jesus and he's cautioning them about the way they're living their lives because believe it or not, he says it's not just conflict that's outside of the church. He says sometimes there's conflict in the church. I know that's surprising, right? I know no one would ever think of it, right? But if you're here looking for a perfect church, if you're going anywhere looking for a perfect church, good luck to you all. You will not find it. Because people are not perfect, and because people are not perfect, you will never find the perfect church. But together with God's help, we can navigate the conflict, and we can still arrive at unity as the family of God, love as the family of God, if we're willing to do things, here's the catch, God's way, and God-honoring ways. So what does James say? James says, well, let's start with you. He asks the question in chapter 4, verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Some of you are like, well, it's because of what they did or what they posted or what they said. I mean, okay, he says, okay, cool. Like, think about that for a second. What causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he says, uh, let me answer the question for you. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Long pause. Uh, No, I'm pretty sure it's what they said. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure it's what they did. I'm pretty sure it's the way they treated my family. I'm pretty sure it's the way that they did whatever it was. He says, no, let's think about this for a second. He says, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Verse two, you desire, but you do not have. Isn't that true of a lot of us? When it comes to conflict, no matter who the conflict's with, we have a certain idea, a certain hope, a certain desire, a certain thing that we would like to see, a certain opinion that we want to be embraced, a certain something that we think that if others don't agree, accept, or do, then guess what? There's going to be a problem, right? We don't like to acknowledge it, but he says, let's start with what's going on on the inside. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So here's what happens. You quarrel and you fight. Conflict exists. In other words, James is saying that you experience conflict because you're not getting what you want. And because you're not getting what you want, he says, here's what happens. There's a lack of internal peace. There's a, a lack of internal and emotional peace. James is saying the source oftentimes of our external conflict is an undetected internal conflict that is raging out of control in each and every one of us. It's something that we think we need. It's something that we think we want. Something that we think we covet, we gotta have. Hey, if they get that, how come I don't get that? Parents, are, 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 you, are you tracking with that? You have more than one kid, right? And so you give one kid something and what do the other kids do? How come they get it and we don't? It's like, 
I don't have a good answer for that, right? They, they asked first. I mean, I don't know, right? But it's not because we're trying to hold out on you, like calm down, right? You immediately go to conflict. James continues. He says, you do not have though, because here's the reality. You do not have because you do not ask God. So we're raging inside. We've got conflict inside. We've got internal pressure that's happening. But instead of going to God, James says the easy thing to do is to just take matters into our own hands, to just quarrel and fight, okay? So he says, Here, here's what you need to know. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive. Why is that? Because you ask with the wrong motives. So hear what James is saying. He says, first of all, oftentimes our first response is not to go to God. It's not to ask God. It's not to even invite God into the situation. It's just like, God, thank you for your love for me, but I got this one. I'll take care of it my way, right? Because I know my way is, well, it's my way. And if I want it my way, then, then I'll, I'll do what I need to do to make that happen. And we quarrel and we fight. Or some of us get real spiritual and we ask God, God, would you step in? But God, would you do it like I want it done? Not God have your way, have your will. God, God, I'm asking you to first change me before you change the situation. God, I'm asking you to, to show me where I'm off, show me where I'm missing it, show me where I'm misunderstanding. But instead, we often just go straight to, like, God, fix them. God, change them. God, turn them around. God, just, just make them go, God. Just make them, just make them leave, like, whatever it is. And, and we're asking God things, here, for the wrong motive. Why? So that we feel good about ourselves and get what we want. But let's be honest, it may not be the best for the relationship as a whole. It may not be best for the group as a whole. And so, so James is, is hitting in on something, something really important. He says, could it be that we're looking for others oftentimes <laughs> and, and, and to things oftentimes in the hopes that somehow they're going to provide for us what only God can provide for us? And when we don't get what we want and we don't get what we need, there's this internal conflict that comes, becomes now an external conflict as we quarrel and fight with one another. And James is trying to help us to start again with us, understanding that conflict is inevitable. But when it comes to our relationships, right, what's going on inside of us, right, is important to address together with God because our reality is, is that me issues always become we issues. You catch that? That was, that was good relational help right there. Me issues always become, if unaddressed, always become we issues. Somebody else always deals with the internal issues that you are facing. If you're not connecting with God on that, not getting the help you need with that, it spills out into our relational life. Often because these things go unattended, we end up doing things in our relationship that ultimately create more conflict. So here's what I need us to understand up front today. You will never see things begin to change around you until you allow God to bring change to what's going on within you. It starts there. We, we have to say, God, I'm inviting you to address me. God, I'm inviting you to do a work in me. Now, here's what I wanna say about conflict today. I get it that most of us, when we view conflict and we, do, we view disagreements, we always view it as something negative. And it's true. Like nobody wants conflict, nobody likes conflict, nobody willingly wants to start conflict. It just kind of sort of happens unknowingly sometimes. But here's what I want to encourage you with. Whether it's silent tension or explosive arguments, it's important to recognize that conflict in itself is not inherently bad. It's not inherently negative. In fact, conflict doesn't always mean that something is wrong. Conflict can also mean that something is right. Let's just think about that for a second. Conflict is normal, as we've said. Right? So it's important and necessary if a relationship is going to grow and mature. Conflict is necessary. The idea of Scripture saying that iron sharpens iron. You ever heard that before? Right? That's not a smooth process. But it leaves both of the irons coming out stronger. Right? I love what Pete Scazzaro says. He says, healthy community is not so much about us not having issues and conflict, but it means that we have a particular way that we approach, approach the issues and the conflict. That as Jesus followers, you and I have a particular way in which we go about it. What I've learned in dealing with people, including my own struggles, is that many of us struggle with resolving conflict. We know the conflict exists. We know who it exists with. We know the issues that are at hand and everything that kind of developed and all, and all the reasons why the conflict is there. But many of us have a hard time finding resolve. 
I think there's at least two reasons why it's difficult. One, it's because we have a, a, a wrong belief or understanding about what peacemaking is. And two, we have a lack of training and equipping on how to navigate conflict effectively. And to think about all the stuff that you learned in school growing up, right? All the stuff that you learn in elementary school, high school, all, I don't know if you're like me, but there are certain things that I learned that I'm like, why are we learning this? I know for a fact, I'm never using this again. Do you remember when you're in elementary school and they made everybody play the recorder? <laughs> right? Or do you remember that one math class where they made you buy the protractor? <laughs> do, do you still use that? Right? What, what about, remember, remember, for some of you, you were taught how to write cursive? How's that going for everybody, right? Some of you are like, I don't, is that a B or a D? Like, what is it? I don't, I'm, it's, it's a struggle. You learn a lot of things that you'll, you'll, you'll never actually use. It's just information. But what's interesting to me is that we get all this information of things that we'll never use, but the things that we can actually use, it's fascinating that nobody ever teaches us that. How to navigate conflict, how to work through disagreements, how to do it in a healthy, God-honoring way. Sometimes that is missed within our homes. Why? Because we grow up in family dynamics that they weren't taught that either. And we pass those things down from generation to generation. It's not until we engage scripture and we see what God is inviting us to that we get a different picture and a better perspective on how do we actually navigate these relational dynamics. In fact, I wanna suggest that there's three options for dealing with conflict. And here's what I wanna say up front as we unpack these three options for dealing with conflict. Two, I'm gonna go through, I think rather quickly, because those two, I'm just gonna say they're not the best approach but I need you to see them because I want you to identify if that is your approach. And then we're gonna talk about a third that we find in scripture that I think is honestly the best or the better approach. It's one that, that God leads us in. It's one that Jesus role modeled himself that I think is going to be incredibly helpful. One of the, the, the number one key indicators in determining relational health and success in relationships is how you handle conflict. And so the first way that we tend to want to handle conflict, the first option is this. Many of us choose to create false peace. We create false peace. You're like, that's weird. F false peace. What, what, is that? what does that actually mean? Often this is something that just sort of happens. We, we, we don't like tension. We, we, don't, we don't really like conflict. And we want everybody just to feel good and just get along. And so what we do is we try to appease the situation. And instead of addressing the conflict or having hard conversations like we talked about earlier, you know what we do? We just try to pretend like it's, 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 just, it's all gonna be okay. It, 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 it just, just, let's let everybody kind of simmer down, right? It's fascinating that when you approach scriptures, Matthew chapter five, Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. And in the opening lines of the sermon, Jesus, he says, I want you to understand uh, what it is to live blessed, the good life. Right? And this is probably some of the most misunderstood of all Jesus' teaching. He goes into what's called the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are those who, and he kind of fills in the blank with all these least likely people that you would think are actually living the good life. But then he says something fascinating that I think is, is, is uncomfortable a little bit, especially when you understand the, the, the core of what Jesus is saying. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And we think peace. Oh, yes. Who doesn't want peace? Peace sounds so good. I mean, this is the good life. If I could just arrive at peace. But see, we misunderstand what making peace actually is. Understand what Jesus is saying. This is not a prescription for how to be good with Jesus. But it's, it's a description for those who are actually following the ways of Jesus. But unfortunately, what's happened in our culture is that we have this huge misinterpretation of what making peace peace actually is. Many people think that Jesus calls us kind of to a certain level of passivity, to kind of just like, hey, don't rock the boat. <laughs> just be appeasers, right? Ensure that nobody gets upset, that everybody is just kind. You know, that's why we come to church and we smile, right? Even though we know we're pretending on the inside to actually like that person because we don't like what they said. No, we're not going to be real in church, right? See, we, we do this, this often over and over again. We, we, we think we're to keep the peace by ignoring the difficult issues and the problems, making sure that we don't speak into those things because if we speak into those things, that ruffles the water and we are called to keep things serene. Isn't that what peace actually is? So we, we usually believe that the idea of peacemaking is to avoid conflict at all costs, to totally skirt around the conflict. And, and, and you know what? It can look nice on the outside, but here's what it creates. It creates a false peace. 
What, what am I saying by a false peace? I, I'm saying that um, you go to, if you, if, I'll just give you one example because I think this probably resonates with you at some point in time in your life. But, but have you ever gone to dinner uh, with a group of people? Right, and you go to dinner with a group of people, but but you know that uh, even though you're going to go hang out with them, things are pretty financially tight for you, right? Inflation got you, right? You know, we, we all talk, we're all feeling it right now, and so money's tight. And so what you do is everybody's sitting at the table, and you're like, because money's tight, here's what I'm going to do: I'm going to order an appetizer, and I'm just going to drink water. Right? I'm just happy to be here. I'm just happy to hang out. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going to get an appetizer or a salad. And I'm just going to have water. Meanwhile, the other ten people that you're with. Right? They order appetizers. They order steaks. Right? They order drinks. Right? They order desserts on top of that. You know? I mean, they got all the food coming because, I mean, why not? I mean, we're out. We don't get out much. You know? Might as well splurge. We're all together. Right? And then here's what happens. The bill comes. Right? It's the end of the time together. The bill comes. And, and of course, you don't have any cash on you because you're strapped. You only have a card. Right? And and so somebody says, you know what? It's going to take forever to figure out this bill and to split it and to get everything going. So how about we just take the whole bill and we just split it 11 ways? That way everybody pays the same thing. And you're sitting there and you're like, everybody agrees with it, but you're freaking out inside because you're like, a $25 appetizer and water, that, that's a bit much, right? And you know that you didn't plan on spending that much money, but yet you don't want to be the weird one calling everybody's attention to the unfairness because you're the only one. And so what do you do? You pay the $25 in the hope of keeping the peace, but what you've created is false peace because you walk away kicking rocks all the way home, frustrated about what happened irritated about what's going on and it creates anger and frustrated and frustration and if those things continue to happen they build upon themselves and then all of a sudden resentment and bitterness begins to creep in and you think well I'm just trying to be cool I'm trying to play it cool and trying to keep the peace but really what I've done is I've created false peace because it looks good on the outside right we pretend all is well but on the inside there's tension there's anger there's frustration this is so incredibly important for us to understand especially as it relates to the kingdom of god the way of true peace will never come by pretending that what is wrong is right the way of true peace is not built upon lies and pretense Right? The, the way of, tr- uh, of peace is not built on false realities and false narratives and trying to pretend like everything's going to be okay. Again, Pete Cazero for the win. He says, you can't have true peace of Christ's kingdom with lies and pretense. They must be exposed to the light and replaced with truth. This is the mature, loving thing to do. Now, many of you are like, that makes me uncomfortable though right? The mature and loving thing to do, that makes me uncomfortable, right? Understand, creating false peace makes it impossible to sustain long-term Christ-like change in our relationships, and it inhibits us from loving well. If we're content to just create false peace, we'll never be a people that learns to love well. We'll never grow in our relationships. Our relationships will continue to be dysfunctional. And when relationships are dysfunctional, we usually move to some sort of of, of way of coping with it that we would call another option, which is we fight dirty. Anybody fight dirty? You're like, well, I don't know. You got to explain what dirty is, right? You know, like... (laughs) John Gottman, uh, who has studied relationships for for many, many years, he says 94% of arguments, right? As it relates to 94% of arguments, he says the outcome is usually determined within the first three minutes. He says how it's gonna end is determined in the first three minutes. In other words, how an argument or disagreement starts will also determine how it ends. So how you go at somebody, how you choose to address somebody, how you choose to have conversation with somebody will also determine the course of that conversation and ultimately how how it will end. Let me ask you the question, how or where did you learn or observe how to handle conflict? Ever thought about that? Most of us, uh, like we've talked about, uh, grew up in a family of, our family of origin, our foo, right? Think back about your foo, okay? We've all come a few from a food that, that has taught us how to handle conflict, how to handle disagreement in certain ways. Some of us were taught to handle conflict as we, we just yell, we just get loud. Anybody from a loud family, right? Anybody from a sarcastic family, right? You know, we just, that's how we handle it. We just get, we get loud, we get sarcastic. Anybody from the avoider family, right? What about the appeaser family, right? We, we, we have all these different ways. We have, we have yellers, sarcasm, avoiders, appeasers, leavers, fighters, right? Where we just wanna fight, See, what I'm trying to say is that most of us, as we mentioned, we're never given tools, never taught what to do with conflict. And the result is that many of us have simply resulted to learning how to fight dirty. 
And I know you're wondering, like, I wonder if I fight dirty. I'm going to give you two options as it relates to fighting dirty because it seems like these are our default response. Maybe you're in this camp and category. The first is this. It'll show up on the screen. The default response is to simply attack. I'm feeling threatened. I'm feeling overwhelmed. So I'm going to attack. I become aggressive and I dig my heels in. I'm going to win this conversation, right? I'm going to do it by criticizing the person in front of me or the people. I'm going to use words like always or never. You always do this and you never do this. Or I'm going to start lecturing people as if I'm the end all be all of knowledge and I have it all right and I'm gonna lecture somebody else if they don't have it right. I'm gonna name call, right? Anybody from a name calling family? I'm gonna, I'm gonna shout, maybe I gotta cuss a little, to make my point, right? Because it always sounds worse when you cuss, right? Like there's no other word you can use, right? But you're just so mad that that's what comes out, right? Right? You, do you see where I'm going with that? We, we, just, we treat it as, as just basic, it's just normal, right? Some of us threaten, right? If you don't do this, I will. If you don't get this done, then I'm going to, you know? Uh, if you don't do this, I will never, right? We, we say all this stuff. It's our way of attacking. It's our way of fighting dirty. It's our way of coming at to prove our point, to make sure that these internal struggles that are conflicting us inside are somehow resolved through the way that I treat you. Maybe some of you fight dirty in an opposite direction. I would say there's another default response that is not attack, but it's actually retreat. Retreat, okay? Which means that I become passive and I seek escape. Anybody there? I become passive and I seek escape. Means I I tend to shut down in an argument or disagreement. I I choose the silent treatment. Anybody love that silent treatment? Silent treatment is so good, right? No, no, it's not, right? You you, want to continue to kill relationships? Use sarcasm or silence, right? The silent treatment is never, never a win. We walk away. Again, we use sarcasm. Uh, We we are passive aggressive, right? We, We lie, because we don't want the responsibility, we push it off elsewhere, we blame something else. Uh, Understand, no matter how your default response goes as it relates to the way that you fight, the results of dirty fighting are always detrimental in any relationship. And while conflict will always exist, those who brought us the scripture understand what we were experiencing. They understand the internal struggle. And those who lived in the middle of the tension and conflict, think about this, in the middle of the tension of, of, of racial conflict between Jews and Gentiles and between the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and and, and now this, this, this small group of people that are Jesus followers, think about the Roman government that was like kind of over, over everything and kind of keeping their, their thumb of oppression upon all people groups and just doing whatever they wanted. They understood living in the tension and the conflict, but they also had to understand a different way of approaching things because of Jesus and who he is. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 12. He says there is a better way. Romans 12, verse 17 and 18, he says, do not repay repay evil, anyone evil for evil. He says that's dirty fighting, right? Just just because you're mad at somebody, just because you have conflict or disagreement with somebody doesn't give you a right to treat them any way you want to. Say whatever you want to. Go about it whatever you want to. Allow your anger or frustration to get the best of you to where you act out of your emotions instead of out of good reason and judgment, Key understanding and wisdom, right? He says, don't repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. He said, this is not about tick for tack. This is not about you knowing how to push their buttons. This is not about your disregard for their feelings or what they're thinking. He says, I want you to really understand them for the people that they are. And he says, and here's what I need you to know. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, this is great, right? Some of you are gonna be like, cool, uh, Paul gave me a way out. Why? Because he says, if it's possible. <laughs> and I want you to know, I understand. I get it. He, he, that, that's what he's saying. He's saying, if it's possible. And, and I actually love that, right? It, it's, it's this the reality that you and I live in. Because here's what Paul is saying. He says, this is not about what they're doing to you or what they're saying about you or how they're responding to you. This is about you being responsible for you. This is about you being responsible for what you say and how you go about it and how you respond to them. So he's saying as far as it's possible, right? If you can find it within your heart as you seek God, as you invite God in the situation, that you can respond in a healthy God-honoring way, you also have to understand that as you do that, there will be some people in your life that understand they're unpeaceable. They don't want peace with you. 
They don't want peace with you. But as far as it depends on you, if possible, as far as it depends on you, Paul says that you are responsible for the way that you respond, for your choices, for your approach, for what you do in conflict. That actually matters to God. God cares about the conflict that exists in your life. He cares about what's going on in your life. And he invites us to move away from dirty fighting to the understanding of clean fighting. That you choose to fight cleanly. What does that mean to fight cleanly? A clean fight is a negotiation between two people for the sake of the relationship. It means we set aside our differences for the moment. We know we got a conflict that exists, but first we agree in advance that if we're going to actually navigate through this conflict, we have to begin this negotiation process with the goal of the good for the relationship as a whole. What is good for you? What is good for me? What is good for us? What is good for the way forward as we work through this together? Clean fighting and fair disagreements is a way to manage the conflict and all the feelings that initially come with it. Here's what I love about this choosing to fight cleanly with the help of God. It's seeing conflict as an opportunity or an assignment instead of something completely negative. It's seeing conflict as an opportunity to resolve things biblically and have an urgency to keep the unity in the middle of hard times and disagreements. That you and I can maintain a sense of unity, maintain this understanding of peace, the peace that comes from God. That it's not the absence of conflict, but it's the presence of God, the harmony of God, the justice of God right there with us as we navigate through this together. If if I haven't been clear yet, I want you to know that, that false peace and dirty fighting is not the way of Jesus. It's not what Jesus calls us to. Jesus calls us always to a third option. It's not us versus them or tick for tack. Instead, he says, I'm encouraging you to pursue making peace. The third option is to pursue making peace. There's a big difference between peacemaking and peacekeeping. A peacekeeper, understand this about being a peacekeeper. A peacekeeper suppresses feelings and avoids conflict in the hope of maintaining peace. I wanna maintain some semblance of peace right? So what that means is like, I have to be my false self, or I have to be fake in relationships, or I have to pretend like all is well because I avoid disagreements so that I can somehow maintain peace. But instead, we're invited to be a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. What is a peacemaker? A peacemaker is a willingness to engage conflict and resolve the outer and inner tension in order to establish peace with others and ourselves. We want to establish peace. We don't want to maintain a peace. Here's what we want to do. We actually want to fight for peace. We, we, want to, we don't want to just try to maintain it and try to appease and try to pretend like all is okay. Actually, we want to work to create peace. What do you mean work to create peace? The word peacemaker in the Greek, right, is a compound word. It's the Greek word for peace, erene. Remember we talked about that word before? That this erene with this other one that's poios. That these two words come together, and the idea of poios is to make or to do. In other words, Jesus is, is saying, blessed are the peace doers. Not, not just peacekeeping. There's a huge difference. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, those that are actively creating peace, going about peace, in the same way that Jesus modeled peace for us. Jesus didn't ignore conflict. In fact, Jesus' ministry, uh, many of us forget this, and his mission seem to be surrounded by ongoing conflict, ongoing disagreement. It didn't matter if it was with the religious leaders, didn't matter if it was disagreement between his closest 12 disciples, didn't matter if it was disagreement with people that he encountered on a road or a traveling journey. The reality was is that Jesus didn't ignore conflict right? He didn't ignore differences. In fact, Jesus taught that true peacemaking actually steps in and chooses to disrupt the false peace in the hope of creating real peace, real peace. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says something really fascinating. He says, I don't think I came to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. And then he starts talking about that it's going to cause conflict even in families, It's going to cause conflict between parents and and their kids and and brothers and sisters. And we're thinking like, whoa, what is Jesus doing? I thought thought he was the prince of peace. He is the prince of peace. What Jesus is saying, don't think I've come to just appease everything and pretend like everything's okay. What I've come to do is I've come to step in and actually make peace. I got to disrupt the false peace that everybody is living in right now. We're trying to keep everything nice and kosher between the Romans and between the religious leaders and between the Jewish community and between all these interesting things 
things that nobody wants to get in and address the core. And Jesus says, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to step into the mess and I'm going to address the core because the core that needs addressing is the core of your soul. It's the core of your heart. It's what's going on inside. It's that internal conflict that you cannot fix in and of yourself. I am going to step in and I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to bring what scriptures teach is the word shalom. Shalom. Shalom is, this, the, is the Hebrew word for peace, which is not the absence of something, but the presence of something. It's, it's the presence of God bringing harmony and justice and wholeness, even in the midst of chaos and conflict. All the way back from Genesis 1, God stepping into the tohu wabohu, the conflict, the chaos, and bringing something beautiful and great out of it, creating humanity, giving humanity a lease on life, calling them to something great and something new. And humanity gets far away from God's intention. And what does God do? He sends Jesus to step back into the mess, to bring restoration, to bring reconciliation, to make peace once again so that we could live into our purpose so that we can live a new life in Christ. Jesus was all about this idea of wholeness and healing in relationships. I love it. I wanna give you an example of what this looks like. I'll put it on the screen and you might wanna take a picture of it, but this is the whole idea that we're talking about. This idea of relationships in the new family of God. It's going from this idea of Genesis 3, right? Where we know that sin happened. That sin was, was, was this chasm that separated God and humanity. It didn't just separate God and humanity, but it caused brokenness between you and I. It caused brokenness between God's family and God's people. And it created defensiveness and it created low self-awareness and isolation and blame and anger and fear and self-absorption and addictions and dishonesty. And the list goes on and on and on and on. But the good news is, thanks be to God, that even when we were stuck in sin. And even though we were lost in our own brokenness, not even aware that we actually needed God, God sends Jesus to step into that very mess. And Jesus moved into the neighborhood like like Eugene Peterson said. Remember that? He moved into the neighborhood. He experienced the brokenness. He knows what it's like to have relational dysfunction. But he did not avoid all the conflict. Instead, he chose to step in, not just in his physical life, but he stepped in all the way to the cross, where he took the cross for you and I to now be the the person that would stay on the cross for us. He would pay the penalty of sin and death that you and I could not pay so that you and I can now live in a new life and we would no longer have to sit in the mess that has been created in our life, but instead now we can move towards wholeness. God's original intention, it's a a place of approachability, of high self-awareness, of non-reactivity, of taking responsibility, of delight, courage, offering self as a gift, freedom, and honesty. Can can you see the clear contrast? Can can you see the tension in which the cross existed? And it's not just the good news of the cross that he paid the penalty for us, for our sins, but it's the good news of an empty tomb. That because Jesus did not stay dead, because he was raised to new life, here's what I'm trying to say, that our relational life can be raised to new life. That you and I can experience new life in Jesus and be made right in a relationship with him, but also you and I can now take a next step and be made right with others. We can be made right with others. We don't have to live in the tension. Ken Ken Sandy, who's an author, he says that peacemakers are people who breathe grace. They draw continually on the goodness and power of Jesus Christ. And then they bring his love, mercy, forgiveness, strength, and wisdom to the conflicts of everyday life. Could, could you imagine what life could be, what relationships could be like if we, if we could do that? If we can experience the wholeness that can only be found in Jesus and the overflow of that wholeness that can only be found in Jesus is that we move from being peacekeepers to now being peacemakers, peace doers because of the change that Jesus has made in us. That it's not just about what they're doing to us or what they said about us or the dysfunction that exists there. We don't have to avoid it, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we lovingly, with grace and truth, we, we lean into it. Matter of fact, I, I love that today we're celebrating baptism. And if you're here today and, and you're, you're choosing to get baptized at nine o'clock, I wanna invite you out real quick just to kind of get yourself ready. Um, if you need a change or if you need to get a towel or anything like that, um, There's people that are taking next steps at nine o'clock and 11 o'clock today because they understand the power of the cross and the empty tomb. 
that Jesus stepped into their life and restored them and renewed them and has brought new life to them. And now the overflow of their life is that, that, that not only restored in a right relationship with God, but now they wanna to move towards right relationships with other people. And it only happens by the power of the Holy Spirit actively working in us. It's knowing that God calls us to be peacemakers, to allow his redemptive and transforming love to spill over into our relationships with the hope of restoration and reconciliation. Some of you are like, I wish I really had some tools for restoration and reconciliation. And I'm glad you're thinking in that direction. I want you to know, write this down, November 22nd. November 22nd, right here at City Line Church, we're gonna do a peacemaking workshop. A peacemaking workshop. We've thought about you in advance. I can't unpack all the tools today. I'm gonna give you some simple next steps that help you start this week. But we're gonna do a peacemaking workshop on November 27th or 22nd. It's gonna be right here at the church. You can start signing up for that later on this week. You'll learn more information through social media. We'll talk about it again next week. But I wanna make you aware that God is active and God's at work and God is inviting us to step in and to be people of peace, to choose to make peace. But if we're gonna choose to make peace, where do I start today? If I'm starting today, where, where, where do I start today? And here's what I wanna encourage you with. I think there's just four things that you can consider that I think will make a lot of sense. You might wanna write these down. The first is this, we start with prayer. We start with prayer. We start with prayer because peacemaking starts with your heart. It starts by examining your motives and your intentions at your hurt before God. It's allowing God to do something in you because if you don't allow God to first do something in you, then you have to understand that that hurt that is not transformed is usually transferred. Meaning hurt people continue to hurt people. And so allow God to heal you. Open up to God, begin to pray and seek him, asking God, God, would you not just heal me, but God, would you get me over my fears and my avoidance and my tendency to want to create false peace or fight dirty? And instead, would you help me to love more like you? You start with prayer and then you choose to make the first move. You think time will heal all? No, time just makes things worse oftentimes. You have to make the first move. The only way to change the situation, to address the conflict is to actually face it. Jesus didn't say blessed are the peace hopers or the peace wishers or the peace thinkers. He says blessed are the peacemakers, the peace doers. Those that are willing to lean in. To be a peacemaker means not suppressing or denying or avoiding, but actually addressing. That we embrace the tension together with God. And we move in the power of the Holy Spirit. We choose to go first. We invite others to conversation. As we invite others to conversation, the third thing is that we choose to believe the best. We start with prayer. We make the first move. And we choose to believe the best. Why? Because it's far too easy to demonize someone. It's far too easy to assume the worst of a person, right? What if, what if instead of us making false narratives and false assumptions, what if we just first started with trust and knowing that we want to believe the best about this person? I know that they can be a little whatever, you know, when you want to fill in there. I know that they can have the tendency to say, yeah, yeah, I know. But what if, what if we can see through that to who they are? What if that we can hold on to the fact that they are image bearers of Christ, what if we can, we can just truly start with what we know to be true of them? Start there. Begin to love them. See, people are not our problem. <laughs> there, there, there's a spiritual enemy that will try to deceive us into thinking that people are our problem. But it runs so much deeper than the person that's in front of you or the people that you're struggling with. There's something more, and Jesus is inviting us to address the more. As we address the more, we speak truth and love. We speak truth and love. Granted, it's difficult. <laughs> this is not a license to say whatever you want, however you want, for the sake of like, I'm just saying my truth. This is, not, this is not that. This is actually growing in spiritual maturity. Paul says, you will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, becoming more like Christ. We need the help of Jesus to begin to speak the truth in love. There's a big difference between holy discontent and prideful arrogance. A lot of times our own pride and arrogance causes us to lash out and say things that we shouldn't. But when we seek God's wisdom, when we invite God into the situation, he begins to change us from the inside out. So I leave you with this understanding of James once again. Before he talks about the struggles that exist inside of us, he simply says this in James chapter three. Who is, 
wise and understanding among you? Who is wise and understanding among you? He says, let them show it by their good life. Where is James getting this idea of the good life? Well, he gets it from his brother, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount. Who is blessed? He says, blessed are the peacemakers. He says, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and unspiritual and demonic, he says. He says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. He says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all, listen, peace-loving. He says, it's peace-loving, considerate, it's submissive, it's full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and sincere. How do we speak the truth in love? It's through the wisdom that comes from heaven, which is first of all, peace-loving. Then it's considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and it's sincere. He goes on to finish with this fascinating statement. Peacemakers who sow in peace, they reap a harvest of righteousness. For those of us that think, man, this is hard work. This is going to be too much. And man, this makes me nervous. And I don't know if I can understand. The promise is peacemakers who sow in peace. Not who sow in pride, not who sow in frustration, not who sow in anger, not who sow, you know, in something other than peace. Peacemakers who sow in peace. Guess what happens? There's a harvest of righteousness. There's a harvest of right living. There's a harvest of right relationship. There's a harvest of restoration. There's a harvest of renewal. There's a harvest of reconciliation. There's a harvest that awaits for those of us who are willing to step in and do the hard work of peace. What am I saying today? I'm saying true peacemakers, they love God, they love others, and they love themselves enough enough to disrupt the false peace in order to achieve true peace. It's Jesus' invitation. No matter how hard it may be, he's not left us or forsaken us. He invites us to do this with him, to lean in and to restore peace. So Father, I pray today, God, that whatever the conflicts that exist in our life, whatever the issues that are present, God, whatever the things that have us just really struggling, Lord God, and maybe just relational tension, that God, you would give us your mind, your heart. You would give us your wisdom. And God, that you would help us to approach them in healthy God-honoring ways, that we would learn to go beyond peacekeeping and choose to be peacemakers, that we would lean into pursuing peace, God, that we would see restoration and renewal in our relationships. And God, I know there's lots of unhealthy dynamics, and sometimes there are certain people, God, that we need to forgive, but we need to see the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. God, only you can can give us that insight. God, you have called us to forgiveness, but God, we know that reconciliation is only going to be by your power. And so, Father, would you do your work in us? Start with us. Let it flow out into our relationships. And may we be people of peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.